I remember when I was young, growing up in the 1970s and 80s, just seven years old, wondering what the year 2000 might look like. It just seemed so far away. I had this image of flying cars or hoverboards or having in them all-in-one silver jumpsuits that people wear in all the films. And the future is really hard to predict. So now I've, as a scientist looking into the future, I can find there's only one thing that everyone agrees on, and it's this. One day, we'll all be wearing silver jumpsuits. That's the only thing science agrees on. And I'm not the only one to try and predict the future. This is some guesses for the years 2000 from the New York Times science editor in 1950. And you can tell he almost got the idea of online shopping. But he, he failed in other guesses like this one. Uh, <laughs> because everything in her home is waterproof, the housewife for the year 2000 can do a daily cleaning with a hose. My guesses weren't that bad after all, I don't think. And now as an academic, I'm now concerned with trying to manage natural hazards. It's essentially about trying to predict the future and give it a voice in the present. And today I'm going to share some problems with how we do this and explain an idea about how we can do it better. It might take around... 10 minutes to explain, but it might allow you to see the next century or so quite differently. Now, I moved to New Zealand around three years ago, and I really like living here, and, and not just because there's no better place in the world to be researching natural hazards. <laughs> it's, it's actually one of the riskiest countries in the world. Um, I was recently at an, uh, a conference on hazards in Wellington, and and one of the speakers was saying that one of, the, one of the mooted marketing angles of the city was this. Wellington, a city where anything is possible, which is correct from a natural hazard perspective. <laughs> you've got tsunamis, sea level rise, coastal erosion, earthquakes. In fact, in many respects, it's an absolutely stupid place to build a city. And, and today, we're, we're, we're stuck with that decision, and we're locked in, and we're paying lots of money to try and protect people. So decisions have a really long legacy that might last centuries. So we need to make sure they're the right ones. So this talk is about how we predict the future and, and consider it in the present. I'm going to explain how we give it a voice, and how science defines it, and how we tend to see it in terms of a, a single destination or a single land use will eventually get up by a certain time. I'll also explain a little bit about how, after every year, the voice gets a little bit quieter until we don't tend to listen to it at all. And this is a really important topic, because there's, there's huge consequences to bad decisions which can be impossible to reverse. If we're building parts of Wellington, Christchurch, London, San Francisco, we probably wouldn't build them in the same place. It's too risky. And if we want to adapt to natural hazards or climate change, we should be building differently or behaving differently or designing different policies. And that doesn't happen very easily. And that's due in part to how we understand the future. Now I want everyone to just take a moment and just think about the concept of time. I want you to think about how it's constructed and how we use this structure in our own heads to make sense of the future and predict what might happen when. So look at this clock. Every second is detailed. And then it's 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, decades centuries, millennia, it goes on forever. Now this switch is actually really important. By having this rational, logical view of the future, it means we've actually got a really good ordering device. We can put whatever event, whatever phenomena we can speak of, at a specific future time. And that allows us to do a trade-off. It means we can think, what are the costs to us now? and what are the benefits to people not yet born. So for example, 
scientists can look at sea level rise in 2050, and policymakers can decide what, if anything, we should do now. Should we stop building in certain areas? Is it too risky? Or do we not know enough? We're not sure. And if we're not sure, we tend to allow it to go on. Do you imagine that's how it works? Scientists provide evidence, policymakers decide, the future's included. When you think about scientists, you tend to think of them having this search for truth or facts. Almost every film has this really stereotypical scientist in the lab coat and the, the pens in the top pockets, and every one of them has questionable social skills. <laughs> Everyone, without a doubt. To make this point better than I ever could, the next slide shows page one of an image search for the word scientist. It looks like we're missing a great party going on there. There's but science isn't actually that rational at all. And scientists aren't. They try to be, but they're influenced by the world just as much as everyone else. Our upbringing shapes us. And the press and the media decide what is and what isn't important. And our choice of research methods can actually define the future in certain ways. So, for example, one way we tend to look at the future is to look at the past. And then we project that forward and, and look for trends. So, for example, if we have a, a major flood this year, we can go back to historical records and we can... We can see, well, this, compare it to now, and say, well, this is a one in a 100-year flood. This is the kind of event that might only happen once a century. And then, all things being equal, we'll get the next one in 2116. But we do seem to be having, rather, a lot of these rare events. Why is that? It's because the past is a really poor indicator of the future. We know that climate's changing. The kind of event that might happen in Wellington now around once every 100 years is predicted to happen every year by the middle of this century. That's every year. And then we have more people exposed, more people driving risk. And so we have a really dynamic system, but some of our methodologies is quite static. Despite our best efforts, sometimes scientists are also taken by surprise and things happen which we just didn't expect. This slide shows how much the ground levels dropped as a result of the Christchurch earthquake. The red areas show where the ground dropped the most. In some areas, the ground dropped by up to a meter. To put that in perspective, that's the equivalent of 100 years of sea level rise in one day. Even when scientists think they're right, sometimes it just doesn't seem to influence the policy-making agenda. This is one of the reasons why we have a rising amount of CO2 year on year. It's because it's far off. Far off threats. They become quieter with every year. Just a little bit vaguer, a little bit more uncertain. Until eventually, they become silent. So m even though we have some flaws with science, maybe the policymakers can mitigate this when they do their talk, but just like science, they also tend to favor current generations over future ones. We have short-term election cycles, which means there's, there's always a focus on being popular. And the press and the media decide what is and what isn't important. And this is partly our fault, too. We want uh, politicians that respond to our views. We want them to respond to us as the electorate, the voters. That said, there is a, an alternative view that maybe we shouldn't listen to the future too much. Future generations will have more knowledge, more technology, more expertise, and they can look after their own concerns. And if we allow economic growth now, they've got more resources to cope with whatever the future might bring. And then more fundamentally, if we're trying to second guess what future citizens want, we're involving them in a democratic process without even knowing what their views are. We know there's a broad spectrum of 
political opinion and people might be in favor of bad development if asked. But this is a weak argument when we think about natural hazards. After almost every disaster we hear, the citizens complaining how this could have been avoided and why weren't their rights given due weight in decisions. To put it another way, while we don't know what future citizens want, we can be pretty certain what they don't want. They don't want skin cancer. They don't want houses falling into the sea. And they don't want to be locked into centuries of costs that could have been avoided. We need to prepare for the future now more than ever. But the ways our science works and our policy works means that it favors current generations over future ones. And this is visible everywhere you look. From the rising cost of housing, to our changing climate, to the growing amount of people exposed to natural hazards. So given this problem, what should we do? Well, I think it's clear we can't expect to predict the future. The world's too uncertain. It's too unpredictable. Social changes are happening so quickly. And the complex system just means we can't get an answer within our models. We also know that we shouldn't necessarily design a policy for 50 years in the future. It sounds like it could be a good idea, but can anyone think of a policy designed in the 1960s which still works for us today? The world's too un unpredictable and changing too fast. So if we can't predict the future, because it's too unpredictable, and we shouldn't have such a long-term view of a policy, and we need to find a way of stop ignoring far-off threats, what should we do? Well, I think the answer is this. If we want to leave a better legacy for future generations, we need to concentrate less on what the decisions are and more on creating decisions that can be changed. This idea is called adaptive decision-making. It aims to change the basis of how we make decisions. We're moving away from a single land use, or a single outcome of a single policy by a specific date, which is what we tend to do, to instead creating conditions which mean any decision can be changeable. To put it another way, instead of preparing for one probable future, which we know from the silver suit thing, never seems to work out, we should prepare for lots of possible futures. So the future is not a, a far off destination we'll eventually arrive at. It's actually a pathway we need to continuously adapt to. It's not a big leap. It's actually small, nimble steps. And if we do this, this brings two big advantages. First of all, it allows us to adapt to an uncertain world. Our decision-making processes are set up to act when there's evidence, when we're sure about things. And if we don't sure, we might not act. Well, I think being sure is part of the problem. Being sure is a 20th century model of decision-making that just doesn't work for this unpredictable world. And it means we're inevitably passing costs forward, just as we're dealing with the costs that have been passed on to us. It also means that we can change as the information changes. So we're not locked into a single vision of the future that might be decades or centuries old. It's common sense, really, to be adaptable. But it flies in the face of just how we see land use, how we see property rights, which are all seen as fixed. We don't tend to move our cities around that much. I think we should be more flexible, more temporary, and more reversible in whatever our decisions are. And so we're not locked in to these costs. If we make more adaptive decision-making the center of whatever we do, what we're actually doing is building in choice into the system. And if we build in choice, we're actually listening to the voice of the future because they can change whatever they want when the time comes. The world is incredibly unpredictable. 
And if the only constant in our world is change, then that should apply to us too. Thank you.